Hello, and welcome to episode 106 of Just Keep Writing, a podcast for writers, by writers, to keep you writing. Mary Robinette, welcome back to the show. Thanks Congratulations so much. on the launch of The Spare Man. Um, we're so happy to have you back here, though, and to be with us for a long time for me and Marshall, who's not with us tonight, but you kind of, you've been there for us a long ways. You, you're kind of the reason we have a podcast going back to 2018 and being on the retreat with you with writing excuses. So it's really always, always happy to see you have you come on and be able to talk, talk about your craft and how you're doing things specifically now on a level where I understand it, where before I was new to everything and I was a baby writer and it was all big concepts then. Um, but happy uh, to have you on. I'm happy to be back. It's always pleasant to talk to you too. Um, we have a list of questions, but Do you want to talk about anything that you have going on right now that we need to be on the lookout for or anything specifically during the process of the spare man? Um, So I guess the the thing is, you know, there's a book. It's out. It's in the world. Um, uh, I can I can demonstrate what an elevator pitch sounds like for the spare man. Yes, that will be great. Okay, so um, so the short form, if if people have I have two ways of doing it. One is that if people have seen, if they they indicate that they're big mystery readers, the chances of them knowing the Thin Man series is pretty high. So I can just say the Thin Man in space and they know what I'm talking about. But if they are not mystery readers, then what I have to do is say, it's a murder mystery on an interplanetary cruise ship with a newlywed couple and their small, adorable service dog. And as they are moving through space... Someone has the audacity to get murdered, and the festering chowder heads that run the ship frame my main character's husband. Cocktails, witty banter, and that, uh, orbital mechanics. <laughs> I absolutely, that's a really good description uh, right there. If, if you haven't read it, which you should, um, where, so I know a lot of people have certain specific bookstores, um, things like that. We always like to support local and things like that. Do you have any preferred places where someone could purchase this book other than like Amazon or Barnes & Noble? Sure. If they go to Parnassus Books in Nashville or Book and Cover in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, they both have signed copies uh, in stock. Um, And I keep a list on my website of different places that people can get signed copies, including straight from me. Oh, amazing. And we can even put links in the show notes for it. Awesome. So we're going to dive in. I'm going to start off with the first question, which is usually our main question that we like to start off our interview with. I want you to describe writing the spare man in three words could be totally unrelated. Unplotted, boozy, (laughs) and uh, fun. Yeah. Yeah fun was i was like that's not a very descriptive one but (laughs) no that's perfect whatever comes to your mind so let's talk about unplotted for a minute what was that about so what i have been uh doing over the course of my career is uh, always trying to kind of push and try new things and when i started writing um the i i didn't understand structure Um, I would back into a good short story and I'm like, well, I don't know how that happened. And (laughs) so I, I really wanted to learn to do structure. So the first many of like most of, I guess, all of the first five novels um, were outlined in detail. Uh, Ghost Talkers also outlined in detail. And when I started starting with calculating stars, I began to loosen my outlines because I felt like I was hitting a point where I had internalized structure enough that I could just uh, let go and and let my inner reader be more of my guide. So when I got to The Spare Man, what I wanted to try, um, which I had tried previously with a different book, um, was to do the Agatha Christie method. She did not plot her murder mysteries, which I was real mad about when I found out, and and now I understand it. Um, she would give everybody motive and opportunity, and then when she got to the end, she would make her decision. 
Uh, and so that's, I kind of split the difference with The Spare Man, but um, the first half of the book, at least, maybe the first two thirds of it, uh, I free wrote. I did not plot ahead of time. I had some big tent post things that I knew I wanted to do. I had a synopsis, um, but I did not have an outline. And then um, at the th- round to the two third, three quarter mark, somewhere in there, I um, did a, a reverse engineer the outline and made decisions and then uh, wrote to the end knowing exactly who I was, who done it. Do you feel um, like writing it in that way uh, freed you up a little bit? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. There are things that I was not planning on doing that 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 came out of giving myself space to to incorporate things that were happening in my my real life, um, which I think made things uh, a little certainly fresher for me. But it, it also meant that there were pieces that were connecting in ways that were um, less obvious. One of the things that I was afraid uh, was beginning to happen with with the the way I was approaching structure um, was that I was worried about my books becoming predictable. Um, and um, like I think formulas and recipes are really good things and people should use them. Um, but at a certain point, if you want to do something original, you do have to move away from those and and just let things happen. Was there a sense of like a fear also in doing that? Like, because you Mm -hmm. were going out of your comfort zone, you were like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Oh yeah. No, I was, I was definitely, there was definitely concern that, um, that I would get to the end and not be able to pull the plot threads together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because of the way I write, uh, which is that I'm having readers read along with me as I go. I could tell that the pacing was working, um, but I had to do major retcons. Like I really did have to go back in and do a big structure pass to 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 fill in some blanks and you know places where it's like I don't know how this person got there. Uh, <laughs> magic. Yeah. So let me ask you also, um, you mentioned Agatha Christie. Mm -hmm. Did you go back and read some of her books to get you either like thinking about murder mysteries? Was that like, or was it other people that you pulled from? Like as far as like just thinking of the genre? It it was mostly uh, the Thin Man movies, honestly. Um, Because the, while like Christie's really fantastic, um, the vibe is very different than than what I wanted. Um, so uh, so it was mostly Thin Man, a little bit of Dorothy Sayers, um, but mostly just watching the Thin Man movies, all six of them, some of them multiple times. I love that. And the next word he used was boozy. So every chapter begins with a cocktail recipe. Um, and if you have not seen the Thin Man movies, they are... Uh, they were made right after Prohibition ended. So the main characters are just drinking all the way through it. I wanted to make sure that people could participate who do not drink. So I also included um, non-alcoholic cocktail recipes in there as well. Uh, but I, I did have to test every recipe um, and invent some. That was a uh, you know, real sacrifice that I made for my art. I love that. Yeah. That's I, incredible. I will- I will say that um, I I do not write uh, while while drinking, um, in part because I it makes me so drowsy <laughs> that I will fall asleep while I'm writing towards the end of a session. I love that. Now, so, kind of a follow up question there: How did you come up with which recipes should be in there and what shouldn't? Because some of them did relate to the naming convention is what I caught mm-hmm. um, relating to some characters and chapters and things like that. So how did you decide which, which one should be there and which one shouldn't? So when I when I started the book, I knew that I wanted to incorporate cocktails. Um, and specifically, I wanted to use uh, Corpse Reviver number two, which is one of my favorite cocktails. And 
at the beginning, I was just going to use them as titles. I wasn't going to include the recipes, but I had a number of readers in my beta group who um, who don't drink and didn't know, like didn't recognize the words, didn't know what a boulevardier was, didn't, you know. So, um, so I at that point decided to include the recipes as well. And because my my initial intention was to um, to try to in- introduce people to the idea that we were doing this, I was like, well, I'll start with classic cocktails, and then we'll get into, you know, once I've trained people that these are the names of cocktails, then then I can can switch to other ones. Um, so sometimes it was that they were making a cocktail in a in a scene. Sometimes the name reflected something that was going to happen there. Um, and there, you know, there are definitely some in there that are just like, well, this is a very good cocktail name. And <laughs> I don't have anywhere else to put it. Like, I would love to say that I was, you know, well, no, all of them have deep secret inner meanings. But sometimes it, it was just, I need to name this chapter something. Well, that's a good cocktail name. <laughs> uh, no, I love it i so for me it actually really helped out because the thesis i'm writing i want to do to bestiary at the beginning of my chapters ah. and so this is a, it's the same concept that you're doing yeah. so i found it really fascinating on like the technique that you're using and what you're employing and so that kind of that's the selfish question for me uh yeah for what i'm currently working on so um since they were um it's a mix of cocktails I made up and ones that exist. Since I was pulling from a different, a lot of different sources, I did have to rewrite a number of them so that there was kind of a consistency in the way they were presented. Um, and I will also say that one of the things um, you you may or may not have noticed, I'm a big fan of using symmetry to create a sense of um, uh, resonance for the reader. And so the book begins and ends with two different martini recipes. Oh. And part of the reason that I chose the martini is that in the original, in, in the Thin Man movie, um, the, the we are introduced to Nick Charles, who's the detective character, um, as he's making a martini. And so that I was like, we're going to start with a martini. We're going to end with a martini. Awesome. I love that. And then the next word was fun. Talk to me about that. Um, it's, so there's there there is a couple of different characters in there that I had just a real hoot writing. Um, Gimlet the dog, uh, Fantine the lawyer, and um, and and then also the the relation. I I treat my relationships like a character, uh, but the relationship between Tesla and Shao was just, it was just, they were fun. I enjoyed spending time with them. Nick, do you want to go? Before I, I was go? just to say, you just named some of my favorite characters right there. Gimlet, <laughs> uh, Gimlet was, I love Gimlet. Uh, Fontaine was incredible though too, uh, because you, you know, part of the world building there's a always like a lag in their communication, which I found so it was, felt very real um, and things like that. It really added character depth because they're replying ahead of time, knowing what Tesla was going to be doing, not listening to them. So they're trying to catch ahead. So it was really fascinating to see that. Yeah, that was that was one of those things. Uh, the time lag was one of those things that was great fun. It was a really useful mechanic and also a giant pain. Um, so to explain for, for listeners, I have the ship traveling at constant thrust and I worked with a, a rocket engineer and he gave me a chart that uh, just massive spreadsheet that shows me how long the time lag is at every at, at every point in the journey. And because they're traveling at constant thrust, it changes dramatically over the course of a day. And that was, and so if I decided that I needed to move a scene, that meant that I had to completely rework all of Fontaine's dialogue to match the new time lag. They like hearing you talk about this just brings me back to Lady Astronaut. I think this is like for for listeners, you do such incredible research 
before you tackle a lot of these projects and things like that. Um, so I thank you for including that and explaining that piece. I never even would have thought about that. Yeah, it, it was fun. Um, and, and you know, I got to use a lot of the stuff that I had learned for Lady Astronaut, the Lady Astronaut books for this. Um, it, it's like Lady Astronaut books are definitely hard science fiction. This is science fiction, but there's there's way there's there are um, like like what is that ship powered by? I don't know. Have no idea. None. None at all. <laughs> it works. Yep. It works, though. Yep. But I'm like, that engine is never going to break because because <laughs> we can't fix a thing that I don't know how it works. Or, you know, that I can't like that. I'm I'm hand waving past. Yeah. Um, I think I re- I love the fact that you uh, write a lot of happy couples and there's still tension and it's fun and it, they're funny. I think you do that really well. And it's one of my favorite parts of your books. Oh, thank you. Um, so my next question, actually, let's talk about naming mm. Tesla's name. Um, it yeah. seems it seems very uh, purposeful. So, can we yeah. talk about that? Yeah. So, um, Tesla comes from a family of inventors, and they named her after uh, Nikola Tesla. Um, and uh, and I wanted a name that um, that had it. It seemed reasonable to me that that would become a first name. Um, you know, in in the way that uh, surnames often become first names at some point, um, the way you name people uh, children after people you admire. Um, I admit that right now, uh, as we are recording this, I am less excited about having named her Tesla <laughs> um, because uh, of the, the link to the car. You know, there there are a number of people who are like, why did you name her after a car? And I'm like, no, the car is named. Oh, fine. Um, oh, good old Elon Musk. Just the devil incarnate. Yeah. So yeah. when you're creating characters and you're thinking of the story, does the character's name come first? Is it, Is that how it usually works with you? Do you just have a plot and then you start naming no, um, it, it, it depends. Uh, I had uh, I had the idea for the novel before I had the names of either character. Um, and I think Shal's name, uh, I think I just hit a random name generator over and over until something popped up that I was like, oh, I like the sound of that. Um, so sometimes their name just like, like Fantine her name appeared when I wrote her, um, you know, and then, and with that name came a backstory. Um, Fantine's mother is a enormous Les Mis fan. Um, so is her father. That was their meet cute. Uh, and so they named her Fantine and she hates the name because people will constantly come up to her and sing badly uh, songs from the musical. Um, so, so sometimes things like that happen. Um, other times I have, uh, Tuckerized a character. Um, Maria Piper originally had a different name and, um, uh, it was Nickel, uh, Maria Nickel. And I realized that I accidentally had, um, uh, Nickel and Silver. And there was one other person who had a metal name, but I accidentally had three characters with metal names and I was like, Oh, for crying out loud. Um, so I switched her name to Piper and she's named after uh, Piper J Drake. And the magician is actually a um, play on, I have a ma- friend who's a magician, Jordan gold. And so Niall silver, we still have a river name and a precious metal. Um, so sometimes it, 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 they come from everywhere. Oh, that's fascinating. I love that. Um, so, all right. My next question, actually, Nick, this is one of yours. I made Nick write his questions down beforehand so I could go. <laughs> which, which, which number is it? <laughs> number three. You can number, ask number you three. 
you want me to go to number three already? already? Just listen, just um, do it, do what I say and follow my flow. <laughs> <laughs> um so I mean I wrote these I wrote these, so I want to talk about Tesla a little bit on this one. Um, Tesla, and it's addressed in the novel, but she does come from a place of privilege, and it's something that she recognizes. Um, I wanted to, like, I love metatextual conversations and things like that, so I want to know what kind of conversation are you trying to have with Tessa's character and her background and her one, recognizing her privilege, and then also using it in certain cases here. Yeah. Um, so my editor described this book as um, a woman of privilege who wants to get her hands dirty, um, which, you know, which I, I thought was a really interesting framing for that. Uh, but I did want to look at the question of privilege um, and that there are there are things that people, you know, that they can be aware of and then still do them anyway. Um, and there's a couple of places where, where it's like Tesla knows that she should not, you know, that, that she is in a position of power and also she will use it like a bludgeon when she has to. Um, and uh, and then the other piece that I wanted to to kind of look at is that um, there's a there's a book called uh, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Uh, which is a sociology book. It's fantastic. I highly recommend every everybody should read it, but every writer should definitely read it. And in it, um, the author talks about uh, axes of power, that everybody has something that uh, where they they have power and privilege, and then another area of their life where they don't, um, where they are disenfranchised, where at the, they're at the low end of a power structure. And what I wanted to do with Tesla was um, was was show, you know, I, I have her have these different axes of power all, all through. But I, I one of the things that I wanted to to also look at was uh, the context. Um, like being famous comes with a lot of power and privilege. But if you put it into a different context, it becomes an enormous vulnerability. And and so that was that was one of the things that I was looking at with her. You know, speaking of um, when you said famous and what comes along with that, I think you did a really good job emulating that in the character about that it's equal um, privilege and equal isolation in a lot of ways. Because I've been working with people who are celebrities and I've been on tour with people and I've literally had to be like their entourage and it is a mixed sword. In my opinion, Mm -hmm. I think there were a lot of times with artists that were really big that I've worked with going through a difficult time in their life and the way that people were terrible Mm -hmm. and would tear them down And would almost, it was dehumanizing, actually. And it made me see fame in such a dark way. I think it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. I, one of the the things that I remember really clearly, which, which informed uh, one of the scenes, um, was, uh, one of the, the world cons, um, Neil Gaiman was there and he was in the lobby and no one was really come up to him, but like I knew him. So I went up and I was like, hello, how are you? And we were chatting. And then um, a friend of mine had daughters there and they really wanted Neil's autograph. And so he did, but it was like it opened a floodgate and I turned my back to, to talk to my friend and his kids and then turned back and Neil was surrounded by people and had been backed against a wall. And like no. people were 20 deep. I mean, it was like this, maybe 10 deep, but it was like this massive crowd around him. And, uh, and so I like contacted uh, Scalzi, who, who just, who was master of ceremonies at that particular one, who just like waded in with a clipboard essentially and extracted Neil. But I, I was just like, oh no, oh no. And, 
and I realized like that is, um, you know, that, that he couldn't go to a fan convention anymore. Yeah. That, I mean, when, when I think about it, that is the downside too. you know, um, fame is trippy to me, you know, Mm -hmm. I think even being a part of someone's entourage too is because then people try to get to know them to get to that person. And I just think that is just really strange. And it's been really strange of people I've been friends with since we were like in our early twenties and be artists together. And then that person blows up and then you watch this, um, way that people can feed into this idea of what they think you are Mm -hmm. and kind of take pieces of you when you're in public. It's just the strangest thing. Yeah. So I think in the book you like nailed it. And I think you nailed it too in the good ways that fame can be used. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that one scene when um, Tesla was trying to open the door and then she (laughs) – use social media to her memes. And I was like, you go with that Kim K version of yourself. Like, I love that. <laughs> yeah, that was that exactly. Was a, that, such that was, a good that, scene though. That was one of, I really enjoyed that scene. That, that was also one of my favorite Fontaine scenes as well, <laughs> because she was like 14 minutes behind. <laughs> Fontaine feel, I feel like she needs her own like, little novella series or something because she just cracks me up she's so hilarious i was like i need more of her yeah yeah uh several several people have asked for that i'm i'm contemplating writing a uh, fontaine dog sits gimlet <laughs> just right i would fanfic. love that i, I would love that there's no, plot. There. there's no plot it's just them ordering dinner and her trying to keep gimlet from not eating it <laughs> I'm here for it. You know, speaking of Gimlet, I think, and this is a spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't read the um, book yet, so skip ahead. Um, When Gimlet was going missing, all I kept thinking about, please do not kill him. Please do not let Gimlet um, be hurt. Because then I was just going to lose it. Like, I felt like I would have started sobbing. Yeah. Uh, So I will will say this is the one spoiler that I happily make every single time. I will not kill a dog. Like you can like I, I I'm not gonna promise that they will be unharmed, but I'm not a monster, I will not kill a dog. Oh, that makes me feel good. <laughs> I feel great like, relief. I know now. the rules. I know the rules. Like not that kind of story, everyone. Not, not that, that kind of story. story. No. Nope. In Relentless Moon, the the cat Marlowe, he he he's a forever cat. He just he's one of those that like, what, you're thirty two now? Who who okay. Exactly. <laughs> So um, our next question, you know, what was your inspiration to put this on the on like a cruise ship in space? (laughs) Well, strange, you might ask. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever heard, but writing excuses does a cruise. (laughs) Um, You know, it's it was literally I I kept thinking I should write I should write a book set on a a cruise ship. I should I should write a murder mystery. I want to do a thin man thing. I'm going to do thin man on a cruise ship. I mean, it was really literally and and specifically it was uh, when we when we did. Did did you come with us when we were on the Oasis of the Seas? No. Oh, did Nick? No. Maybe it was just Marshall. No, I would. I don't think Marshall was either. So I was 18 and 19. Yeah. So the the Oasis of the Seas is bonkers. Um, it is just this enormous, enormous ship. Um, you know the the water show that Cirque du Soleil does. So they have a water show on the ship with three story uh, diving boards that they can't use in high seas because otherwise the divers do not land in the pool, and um, and. There's a full-size carousel. There's an arboretum. And then there's a bar that is an elevator. And so you're sitting at the bar and it takes you up through the arboretum and then back down again. It was just like, you know, ice skating. It was bonkers. I'm like, if anyone is going to, if we're going to have luxury cruise ships in space, they are going to be every bit as bonkers. It's the one thing, like, I really wish that I had been able to take people around more of the ship. So speaking to that, then, did you have like even more when you were world building, were you like really uh, putting a lot more of the ship in the story that you had to remove? 
No, um, the way I tend to do things. Well, actually, no, that that's not true. Um, I had a zero, uh, a zero G, uh, section of the ship initially, and then realized that for the length of time that I needed them to be traveling, that I couldn't have that, and that it had to be, um, that that they the central section needed to be lunar gravity. So, um, so I, I did have to cut that, um, which would have been fun. Um, I don't think there were any other things that were very specific that I cut. Um, I debated having, um, I debated having engine failure. Um, I debated losing, um, losing rotation so that we did have loss of, you know, loss of centrifugal gravity. And None of those were actually the story that I wanted to tell, so I didn't. I didn't pursue them. Did you map out the way the ship looked before you started writing it, or did that happen? Like, do you do any sketching or anything like that before you do that? Um, I do. Um, so I did a, a very. So basically, what I did was I took. Um, I took the independence of the seas and I took each of the levels and put them into a ring. Um, so I, I figured that part out. Um, and then Max worked with me to figure out exactly how big each level was to, um, to be able to hold the number of people we wanted to hold and to have uh, the, the, um, the level of, of a uh, spin that we wanted to have to be comfortable. Um, and then at a certain point I did need to draw a little more detail for myself to, to figure out, okay, so how do we get from here to here? And, you know, things like that. Um, but I did not, I, I will often, um, write for a little while and then realize that I need to do a map and then do the map and then have to go back and fix the writing and then continue forward. Um, I, I did that with Relentless Moon and the um, the Lunar Colonies. Uh, so it's, and, and then sometimes I will map it out in detail and, and, or use a real existing place. But, but no, I did not. I, I'm fortunate because I have a pretty good visual, um, visual s- imagination so i i generally don't need to map it out right at the beginning i love that i asked just because like the way that like the science fiction novel i'm writing everything starts off as a painting because mm. it usually comes from a, um a dream or something right. that like i've been like turning over my mind so for me and i know you I know you like have an art background and everything. So for me, everything always starts off with a really an image. So like if you looked at my mm. apartment, I literally have all these paintings that if you if you read my story, you'd be like, oh my gosh, this is from that. But it usually starts out visually for me of how I have to start creatively working on things. Oh, that's great. It's, my brain's weird. That's what I think of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Nick, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so set cruise ship in space. You have writing excuses retreat, which is wonderful. If you haven't gone, go. Um, I want to know, like, because I the years I've been on, there have been instances where things undoubtedly happen. You have to get the ship involved and things like that. But I'm curious. So I'm like drawn from your experiences of running a cruise and having issues where you have to get the the crew involved. And then international um, international water laws um, that we have in the U.S. How does that? How did you take all that and that research and apply it to your space setting? So I actually got to talk to a space lawyer, um, which was really a cool. A space lawyer. This is a thing. This is an <laughs> actual job with more than one person practicing it. There's like there are conventions of space lawyers, which is just like. This is I'm insane. So I didn't know. So delighted that this is a thing in the world. So, oh my gosh. Um, 
Yeah. So I got to talk to a space lawyer, and it turns out that space is not governed by maritime law. Um, and also, there are no rules about murder in space. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which meant that I got to make up stuff. Um, so uh, we, on with writing excuses, because we work with um, with a travel agent who travels with us, um, we don't the the cast the staff of of the retreat portion of it we never have to interface directly with the crews um for that kind of thing um the interfacing that i have done uh was all after the book was written um and what i found is that uh like and this was also true before as well too but um they select for people who are interested in helping other people. And so, um, so I'm not, uh, I think that uh, Chief Weiser was the, you know, there, there's always, every group has an asshole. And I think he's, he's, he's the, the asshole exception. You know, I love that you said that because, Nick, I'm just going to tell her about our conversation. Um, yeah, no, that's fine. I was going to bring it up, too. <laughs> Nick um, was first reading the first section of the book. And he was like, um, and Nick, you can jump in, too, when you want. But I love well, and, and I, I do want to say this. You don't get a Mary Robin at Kowal book without getting the audio book, just for the record. <laughs> so I listened to the audio book and... Maybe my kids were distracting me at certain portions, but I, you know, it sparked a conversation between Will and I. It sparked about actually a, a, about police in general, hmm. because Nick has a lot of friends who um, are police, and he felt like you know, I just felt he and uh, Nick, you can jump in too. I don't want to speak for you, but I'm just retelling our conversation because it actually sparked a really meaningful conversation. Hmm. Nick grew up with police who were good people and who were responsible police people. And he felt like, I don't understand, like what is what's going on? I feel like the police are like assholes in here or they're dumbed down. And I was like, well, you have to keep reading the book first. Okay. You got to see how the story plays out. But I had to rebuttal him because uh, I talked about this on the podcast a little bit. I always forget what we put on the podcast and what we actually talk about afterwards. But I grew up in a really poor neighborhood. It was very black and Hispanic, um, the police were never viewed from as a very young child as that kept us safe. It was never viewed that they were good. It was always viewed that they were problematic and deeply insidious. Mm. And I had to tell that to Nick. And I said, I think Mayor Robinette nailed it. I think that is exactly what the institution of policing does to people. And I said, I do think there are good people because there's good people in everywhere. But when you have an institution that is deeply rooted in slavery um, and those types of laws that of where they developed from, I find it problematic. And I think too many times we glorify. I'm going to roll back for a minute. I think a lot of white people will glorify mm -hmm. the nature of policing because they don't have these experiences of living in these neighborhoods. So it really sparked a deep conversation that me and Nick had for about an hour and a half about the way that we grew up and, the, and what we saw. So I one, want to thank you for that. But mm -hmm. I also feel like you leveled it really well because of, um, you know, security officer Piper, you know, because you yeah. did see someone who was very, um, you know, sh doing her job and doing it well and wasn't, you know, an asshole. So that's yeah. what, Nick, you want to add anything with that? Yeah, no, it, I mean, and it was a really good conversation. And it, it, it is a point of me that over the last couple of years, like I do recognize my place in the world and why I have had the experiences that I've had. Um, you know, it was, it's it's always like my first initial shot thought of police is never 
from Will's experience, it's always from my point of view there. And so it, it, it sparked the conversation and I paid more attention to it. And it like, and it just, it didn't bother me, but it was like, Hmm. Okay. We're doing this. Okay. And then like, as we get more towards the end, it's making more and more sense. Mm-hmm. I started, I stopped looking at him as a, as, as police is really what changed me. Once I started looking at him as just a person, then it all clicked for me. I was like, oh my gosh, like, no, this is the right character. This was the right choice. Like everything makes sense, especially at the end. Like, you know, it really just hit home with me. So like, it took me a while to get there, uh, but I did get there and it, it, you know, back to like where Tesla comes from, you're having so many different conversations in this book. Well, and I, I think that, you know, that there are, I think that there are people who go into policing because they want to make a difference. Um, but I also think that there are people who go in uh, and, and you know, there's some research behind this, but there are also people who go in um, because it gives them a sense of power. And then they use and abuse that power because that is part of the way they, they feel good about themselves. Um, Wiser, um, I mentioned in the book that he's, um, that he's 70 ish. Um, the book is set in 2075, which means that he would be in his, he would be like 25 today. Um, you know, so he's, so he's, he's like, he's a 25 year old white dude right now. Um, and he's, you know, He's living in in a little bit of privilege, um, and he's living, you know, in one of the places that I grew up where, um, you know, I'm in a very red state. And, you know, he did – he grew up in a place where people, uh, like, are not supportive of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and, and those – the, the the things that we learn now, um, those are things that we have to, that we, you know, that's programming that sticks. Um, like I had to, even though I wanted to, to write this, this book with um, where, where, you know, everybody, you know, positing a future where uh, the, the default gender is non-binary and, and, and neutral. And then you, and then you assign a, a pronoun to someone in your own head when they provide it to you and not before that. Like I, that's this, this, you know, this thing I wanted to do. And um, I had to bring in a sensitivity reader because, because the, pr- I grew up with binary gender um, and it's heavily programmed into me. Um, gender roles are, you know, there there are defaults that I have um, that I didn't realize I had until I had somebody go through and do it. And so Wiser is in the same shape that I'm in, but coming from a different place and and someone who has not had any reason to examine his his programming. Wow, that is such I mean so fascinating to me that like you, the level of depth that you put into these characters, the conversations that we're having because of it, like a masterclass on this stuff uh, as we talk about it and highlight it here. Will anything else on that subject? Um, no, no. I mean, I could go on and on about police, honestly. So let's not do that in this episode <laughs> <laughs> because I have, All right. I have some strong opinions. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, so Tessa's also a character with disabilities. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that can be very intimidating and scary to write a character with disabilities and things like that. Um, and I wanted to kind of ask you about that on how, like, how did you go about making sure you were being inclusive with Tessa's disabilities and what did you do to make sure it was done in a positive manner? So I think one of the things that happens to writers when they are uh, approaching something 
um, you know, like disability, um, is that they they approach it from a place of um, I don't want to get anything wrong. I don't want to get in trouble. They approach it from a place of fear, and um, and what I have found is that it works much better um, if you approach from um, you know, as you say, inclusiveness um, of looking for uh, looking for the the places of um, curiosity and joy and and engagement with that, uh, and specifically with th- what I think about is um, I think about skill sets. Like, what are the skill sets that Tesla needs to move through the world that someone else doesn't? Um, you know, hopping briefly back to the police conversation, Will has a completely different set of skills for interfacing with police than you or I need. You know, I, I just need to cry and then they'll do whatever I need them to because I'm a white woman and I'm specifically a white woman of a certain age. And, you know, oh, did I? Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I just I don't know what I was thinking. You know, we've had, you know, so it's like yeah. it's totally different. Not that it, it, like um but uh, but it it's true that, that that there's there are these different skills and um it's funny i in the afterward i talk about um the influence that my mom's uh deep brain stimulator had on 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 the book and and um and i i forgot when i was writing about it um that I like, you know, twenty plus year career in puppetry. I forgot to talk about any of my injuries, um, because it's my normal, and I have acquired a set of skills that I use to move through the world to be able to do the things that I want to do. So I don't. So it's like. I, um, the, the crouching with a straight back, um, I have to be very careful about how I get out of bed. Um, cause when I was early in my career, I had a thing happen with my back. Um, and it's fine if I do my exercises and if I use my skill set. and I've been using it for so long that I do not think about it as being a different set of skills than other people have. So with Tesla, um, and with, with generally speaking, when I'm thinking about approaching a character, um, I, I think about like, what are the skills that they have? How do they use those skills? How do, what are the things that they do that move them through the world rather than, than thinking about how are all the things, what are all the things that I can get wrong? I, I focus on what can I get right? Um, and then the other piece of it with with Tesla is that um you know she uh she she really only thinks about the the pain um when her skill set fails so so by demonstrating okay i'm crouching with a straight back it's like that's demonstrating to anyone who has any back problems and they're yeah. like oh yeah yeah, um, no, it, I can't thank you enough for the way that you did it, um, because, you know, we use the word inclusive, right? Um, but you did it in a way, like I said, it's a positive manner. Yeah. Uh, did and you did you go through sensitivity reads? I had um, I had a number of beta readers who I did not uh, not for that. I had a number of beta readers who had had mobility issues who were okay. with common on things. Um, uh, and then like, also because um, I'm, I'm friends with uh, Fran wild and have had enough conversations with her over the years. I knew that I needed to track the cane in every single scene. Um, he, because, yes. uh, because I'm not a cane user. Like, and, and I want to be really clear. It's like, I have, you know, there is a, a community of people who have disabilities and the disabilities that I have are not, or the, um, the things that I have going on in my body have never, uh, had any kind of visible disability. So I haven't, 
Like I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm living in a place of privilege as far as that goes. Right. Um, so, uh, so like I knew that I needed to do things like make sure you know where that cane is at all times. How many hands does she have? Um, and that's, you know, it's really about listening to people a lot. Um, I did have Tesla in heels and, and, uh, at one point, and someone who was a cane user and had back problems, one of my beta readers was like, heels? I was like, oh, oh, no, you're right. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, it was really, really well done. It was something that, like, I kept noticing. And Fran's one of my professors, too, and she she talks about it in class as well. Like, she, you know, she brings up, like, someone who has a hurt hand, like, all of a sudden you're having them bring in groceries and, like, they have four arms all of a sudden, like... Yeah. Just little things like that. Um, so, you know, I, I caught on to that. It has been a little bit on my radar over the last year. So it it was a good piece to have. And something I think as, as you read this book, pay attention to that to really, like, get a good understanding of how it's done correctly. Okay. So now my next question is I want to talk about marketing of The Spare Man. What has been different? In comparison, because this isn't a part of the Lady Astronaut series, which have been super successful um, and like really like amazing. Can you talk to me a little bit about what is different launching a new book after going on the success of that? Um, how has that been for you? And, you know, is it just as challenging releasing the Spare Man and a, a group of new characters? compared to the Lady Astronaut series? Um, so this is actually a little bit of an interesting um, insight into uh, to the ups and downs of an author's career. Um, so the Lady Astronaut books did very well, uh, but the third book, Relentless Moon, came out in July of 2020, and the numbers were down for that. Weirdly, it was as if something was going on. Um, but because of the way publishing works, what publishers do is they, they look at the numbers of your last book and they don't look at the, uh, the context necessarily. Um, so they decided that, uh, this book was not another lady astronaut book and that it was not a lead title. And so they put, um, what they felt were an appropriate number of resources behind a book that was, not a book that was a flagship um, of any sort. Uh, so that meant um, that I wound up needing to uh, do more uh, more work than I would normally have done. Um, in the before times, my publisher would have sent me on tour. Um, they didn't feel it was appropriate for this book. So they said that it was uh, too difficult to get me into to bookstores. Um, so I and my team approached bookstores directly who were very happy to have us come out. Um, but it did mean doing things, um, doing, doing more to support the book than I, I would have normally. Um, normally I would do things like coming on this, um, going on a tour that my publisher had arranged and, you know, they are, they're excited by the book, um, but they see it as in a very particular place in the ecosystem. Um, so it's, you know, there's an idea that authors have that once you make that first sale, um, that, that then everything follows naturally after that. And the truth is that you always have to hustle. And uh, I had two choices. One is that I could say, oh, okay, that's great. That's how much we're going to do. Fantastic. Or I could say, okay, you know what? I have my own resources. Um, I, I know what this book can do. And, uh, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the work because if I don't, um, no one else is going to. And, um, you know, and when I give them things that we have done, they signal boost some of them. Um, and it's it's frustrating. I I like to think of myself as a team player. Um, and I understand that not every book 
you know, is a lead title. Um, but it was frustrating to go from having been a lead title back. Uh, that was that was frustrating and unexpected. Um, and so that was, um, you know, that has been uh, a, a uh, journey, a learning experience. I've got a whole bunch of new skills. Um, I have a really great new set of teammates. Um, I'm excited to be able to take that going forward. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to, we're going to have a completely different conversation. Like this will allow me to have a very different conversation with my publisher when the Martian contingency is ready. Um, so it's, it's been frustrating, but it, there's also, you know, everything is an opportunity to learn something new. Do you like when with that conversation, like say with the Martian contingency, is that going to have to be through your agent or is that something that you'll be at the table as well saying like, hey, you know, I don't know. Um, there's <laughs> so many variables between now and when I turn that in. Um, it's something that I will like. That's why I have an agent. Um, and we've talked through a couple of different possibilities. Um, but a lot of them are dependent on what happens with Martian with uh with the spare man over the next you know couple of months mm. um and so i don't you know and i don't want people to it's very easy to listen to me talk about something like this uh and think well why should i go into traditional publishing um because you know i'm in an effort to be um transparent about the, the possible paths in front of you, it, I can say things that sound kind of scary. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, downplay the fact that my my publisher got a fantastic artist uh, that I could never have gotten, that we went through a number of iterations on that cover to come up with something that I was happy with. Um, you know, that the, I think that my publicity and sales and marketing team um, did the absolute best that they could, given where the overall structure had decided that the book was placed. So, you know, that affects the resources that they have. Um, so, like, I think everybody is operating from a place of good faith. It's just, uh, it was not the choice that I expected for this particular book. I'm kind of surprised by it, though. Um, and for me, like... Especially after what Brandon Sanderson just did through Kickstarter and stuff like that, you have a pretty good following of readers. Not nothing. I like mean, Brandon. nothing like right. Brandon. But it's still kind of like the success that you've had, though. I'm surprised that's the route they went with your previous success and like just kind of being like, ah, oh, this is the this is is what it is. Like, I get it. It's the it's the industry, and sometimes this happens. But to me, I'm just surprised by that. It was, as I said, surprising for me as well. Um, but uh, I, um, I, you know, I'm not Brandon, and I'm clearly just going to have to win some more awards. To- <laughs> and you will. You know, I just, I think, too, I think the learning lesson is about an artist, too, is that, you know, this is a business, you know, and that, like, our publishers, our, aid, you know, our agents, like, you know, Yes, we want to have friendly terms with them. And I'm going to speak from experience on a totally different way of having an agency as someone who does hair and makeup. Um, Mm. I love them. Um, But also, I am my biggest um, cheerleader. Mm -hmm. I am the person that will constantly be like, well, what's going on? What are we doing? How are we game planning? And if they're not pitching me, then I will do whatever it takes to make sure that I'm getting what I deserve. You yeah. know, so I think as an artist, whatever medium you're in, you have to surround yourself with people who who are your cheerleaders, who are going to tell you um, what's good, basically, you know, and go from there. Uh, so with that being said, how is it that we can help make the spare man successful? <laughs> uh, buy copies for everybody for every occasion possible. <laughs> I love that answer. I mean- you got a website that was signed copies. I could take 10 of them. Uh, I mean, I, surprisingly, I have a 
big group of people at work that read. And we always get together and talk about what we're reading. And, you know, I just might do that now. Thank um, you for the suggestion. Yeah, happy to. Um, thank you for, for the asking that. It, I mean, it's the same thing that is true for, for every author. Um, so just speaking in general terms, when an author has a book that's coming out, that, and this is an author that you like, um, pre-order the book. Because publishers look at the pre-order numbers to decide how many copies they're actually going to print. Bookstores look at the number of copies that a publisher is going to print to decide whether or not the publisher has faith in the book. Um, and then they uh, they order ac- accordingly. Um, and this is especially true when it's a debut author. Uh, with an established author, they're going to look at the overall sales to see how things move, to see whether or not they need to keep copies on the shelf. Uh, authors get the most royalties from hardcover. So, like, buying books in hardcover is going to help the author the most. Um, ebooks are where they see the least. Um, well, ebooks and, and audio. But any sale is a good sale. Um, and checking it out from the library, uh, putting a hold on the uh, on it at the library, making a request at the library if you can't afford to buy things. These uh, like libraries are fantastic magical places, and uh, and they buy books. So your hold causes them to buy another book, and uh, and all of those things uh, tell the publisher about you know about the interest. That people have in the book. And then the next thing is that the only thing that people are certain sells books is word of mouth. So if there's a book that you're excited about, you evangelize for it. Yeah, I think that's a great way. Like, um, I'm always giving books away. And, you know, Mary Robinette, me and my sisters have book clubs over your books. So (laughs) it makes me so happy. (laughs) It's like literally because they knew your book was coming out. And I was like, what do you want for Christmas? And your book was on the list. So I was like, all right. Yeah. So we'll talk about it. That's usually our thing. It's like we usually have book club, especially after Christmas. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I think. um, Yeah. Sorry. You should. uh, Have you have you read uh, The Monsters We Defy yet? No. Leslie Penelope, speaking of evangelizing about books, Leslie Penelope, this is um, Prohibition era Black Washington heist novel with ghosts. Oh. Um, Also, the main character lives over a hair salon. Um, Wow. (laughs) All right, you just had me right there. Um, and there's amazing. Uh, there's a, it also introduces you to to, to Gay Washington as well. Oh, bring it on! Person. Yeah, all right, it's I'm great. here for it. All right, I it's can't great. wait to read it. Um, and the is audio there, is fantastic as well, Nick. Oh, the audio is. Oh, mm-hmm. I, I do love my audio books. Yeah. I do. So I I tend so I'll once I get the hard copy, it will be the third purchase of your book. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm this weird person. If I have the audiobook and I like the audiobook enough, I get it on Kindle and I'm like, well, I need to build my library up in my home. So I need the hard copy now too. Uh, and all And my wife is a reader now too. So it's, this is one of those books where it's like, okay, I have three copies of it and all three copies are being used. So I, happy I, for this. This makes me very happy. Someone told me and I just, I laughed in their face, which was perhaps not the correct choice, but they told me that they had bought a copy of the book and then they bought a second one just to keep on their bar. <laughs> I love that. It's just, I'm just like, why didn't you keep the first copy on the bar? And they're like, well, I didn't want to get it messed up with. And I'm like, well, it's just... <laughs> the silliest thing. I love that. That's amazing. Is there anything that you would like to uh, mention or talk about or shout out your socials um, to our listeners? And the floor uh, is yours. My, my socials change constantly right now. Um, the, the Actually, yes. Please, uh, please sign up for my newsletter. Um, that's the best way to find out where I'm going to be, if I'm going to be in your town, um, if I'm putting out a call for beta readers, uh, or sign up for my Patreon 
Um, I teach a class once a month, and when you uh, when you join at the live streaming class level, uh, you also get access to my archives, which include about four years of lessons. And they are amazing, I have to Thank say. You. So everyone should sign up. And we'll put links in the show notes and everything. And so our final question is our just classic question, you know, Mary Robinette, what keeps you writing? Uh, you do. Um, I, I realized that uh, at one point when I was, um, I was upset and um, wasn't motivated to write because, uh, because I was unhappy with um, some, some publisher stuff. Um, and I realized that, uh, that's not why I write, you know, publication gives me money, um, and it gets me a wider audience, but the audience is why I write. It's, it's, it's you, you're why I'm writing. Um, and so what, keeps me writing is thinking about who I'm writing for. And this has been Just Keep Writing, a podcast for writers, by writers, to keep you writing. You can find us at justkeepwriting.org. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Feel free to reach out to any of us on our social medias, and please jump in our Just Keep Writing Discord channel. Links to all of that is in the show notes. Lastly, please support our show by going to patreon.com slash justkeepwriting. We offer daily writing prompts, early access to podcast episodes, and much more. Thanks for listening, and just keep writing.